do you model healthy boundaries, given that the boundaries we're, we're establishing are on behalf of this you know, imaginary entity? What will happen if a building can remember, like can it dream, like can it compute our emotions, our memories, our expectations? My project sits in kind of this space like uh, the history of, gun, of gunpowder, or the idea that a technology to one culture could be very different to another. What is a water reclamation plant that's automated to one group is a studio space to another. It was always important for me to work with some kind of data sets or bathymetric maps or satellite imagery. Machine learning systems, they learn by example. And who gives them the examples? These, the answer is human labor. To me, there isn't really anything other than storytelling and science. And, and I don't think my colleagues um, appreciate that. Fiction Entertainment is a postgraduate master's program, a one-year program, where students work with the techniques from film, fiction, video games, and documentary to tell stories about the emerging conditions of the 21st century. What we were working with this year was the implications and possibilities of emerging technologies of AI and automation. So we were trying to think about what these technologies might mean for the futures of work. We were trying to think about conditions of what personal relationships might look like in a context where our smart fridge might be talking back to us. So students were trying to engage emerging science and technology and to project possible futures of what it might be like to share our world with thousands and thousands of autonomous objects. What we tried to do in the studio was bring in the scientists and technologists that are normally working within their own disciplinary context and to bring them in direct kind of mentor relationships with the students where they were really supporting the student developing their work and, and acting as a collaborator. One of the key ideas we were looking at when trying to set up these relationships was the way that we could bring techniques from the entertainment industry into science and technology discipline. A lot of the research that that these technologists are doing is so critical and really is the basis of fundamental changes that are going to come about in our lives. In fiction and entertainment, we're interested in this idea that, that storytelling or the mediums of film or video games are, are extraordinary shared languages. They're, they're how our culture shares and disseminates ideas. So what we're trying to do is take these ideas from science and technology and encode them into those mediums of popular culture I'm Jules Jaffe. I'm a research oceanographer here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We are in La Jolla, California, and we're sitting now in one of my labs where we build underwater instruments. And I'm really interested in outreach because I think scientists don't do a good enough job portraying what we are paid, endowed, granted to do. So I was like, this sounds like really cool. You're doing a VR piece on the ocean, and if I can be your science advisor, I'm happy to do that. I'm Deborah Harrison, and I uh, run the Conversational UI team, which is a team at Microsoft. We're responsible for crafting uh, conversational experiences. You know, I think of that sort of, you know, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a Talmudic uh, aphorism, something about, you know, it's, it, it may not be your duty to, um, to complete the work, nor, nor is it your right to abandon it. You know, there are people that have a lot of intellectual curiosity and sit around and will, you know, read books on the world and how it works. But more people are reading stories than they're sitting around and reading a physics book. So if we can interleave the storytelling with the science and heighten people's awareness, then I think it's really important. 
So I think what we're trying to do with the work that's being produced from the Fiction Entertainment Program is create projects that somehow have meaning or have the capacity to affect change. Because it's quite possible to, to launch a fiction into the world with enough force that it finds traction. A lot of those uh, visions, if you will, uh, Terminator, Skynet, etc., they talk about one end point of where AI might be or might go to. In the here and now, human beings power these systems. So instead of focusing on where the endpoints of AI are going to be, let's look at the workers we're using now. Let's celebrate them and their accomplishments and their achievements and their contributions. So a lot of our stories, a lot of the traditions of filmmaking has been based around very human-centric points of view. So I think what we're moving into is a whole generation of new forms of story where we can totally reimagine what the hero's journey might be in a context of Amazon Alexa. I'm Refik Kanadol, I'm a media artist and director, currently working and living in Los Angeles. So right now what I'm trying to imagine in the last three years, how we can give a cognitive skill to the built environments. The past and the future is clearly aligned with technology itself. And science is a fundamental truth. As a believer in science, I don't think there's other B plan for humanity to survive in the near future. Sometimes what is really hard about the near future is like how do you feel it in a way that has this tangibility. And I think cinema is an incredible field of imagination because you need, you need to create something real, but at the end you use reality as an input to feel something unreal. So what we're trying to do is work with science and technologists and, and try and talk to them about how they want to connect to audiences and then use our projects and use the skill sets of our students to start to project their research outside of the normal conferences or academic journals that that research would normally appear. What we saw was someone like um, Jules who sits down with Sharuk who's exploring remote sensing and they were sharing techniques and, and technologies. Jules was talking about their data collection process where they're using a massive field of uh, buoys drifting in the ocean, constantly collecting temperature data, pollution data, and sending it to the cloud. And then Sharuk was using that live data set to inform her VR experience. So my name is Ruk Pramontini. My interactive VR project is called Current Affairs. The environment that I explore in my uh, VR project is a speculation of the near future of the ocean, which is um, plastic and debris filled. And although plastic is such a per pervasive uh, material, it can be found almost everywhere in our environment today, it is still impossible to track it, especially the marine plastic is invisible both for the human and the machinic eye. I was lucky to work with different people. One of them was Jules Jaffe. He shared with me a lot of his uh, information and data sets. He gave me really interesting microscopic 3D models of um, coral polyps. There's, there's a difference between, you know, theater, art, um, engaging the public and rigorous science. And I, I, I made it clear that those boundaries for me were kind of flexible. Science gives your story a basis and something to build upon. At the same time as an artist, if you work with researchers or scientists, it's always about how do you translate their research. What was more important to me was the idea of creating an emotional reaction in the public to get people emotionally involved in marine conservation. So, so often with contemporary and emerging technologies, it, there's real value in playing out the possible futures that they set in motion. We had a project by Jeremy Hartley in the studio. So Jeremy was imagining a series of Afrofuturist landscapes developing and evolving through autonomous landscape production infrastructure. My name is Jeremy Kamal Hartley. Um, I'm a visual artist and the title of my piece is Mojo. 
The film kind of explores a world where landscapes are kind of mitigated based off of the values of black culture and it's making black culture the centric cultural model of how landscapes looked, are designed, and are shaped. In general, the te technology in the film is a way to alleviate the necessity for any labor to take place in a landscape. And as such, blacks who are enjoying the landscape can enjoy it with leisure. I had a couple conversations with Memo, and uh, what was great about that is he already is exploring these things in almost a real grounded way where he's messing with computation and programming to explore different cultural, perceptual, and scientific things about ourselves. A lot of what he gave me from a large narrative arc, it wasn't so much the specifics of like how to program, but um, just the larger ideas of how technology and culture um, can actually intersect and gives us something different and a different way to look at something. Sid was working with Kate and her project about automation and labour. And Sid was informing her project in terms of thinking about what a worker's relationship is to an AI employer. Frontier Solutions is a speculative short film that looks at the evolving American Western frontier and the future forms of labour that may exist within it. The film explores themes of isolation, loneliness, and the frustrations of on-demand labour in a vast and rugged automated landscape. We follow the last person working the last job amongst the machines of the New West. One of the most important aspects of projects like Kate Studeville's is that they shine a light on the workers that power modern AI systems so that as we grow further in the future and we make further technological changes, we're treating the humans that power these changes and power the advances fairly and ethically. So one of our students, Rick Farron, um, was uh, working on um, an interactive concept album and his narrative hinges around the imagination of one lead character, Echo, who in some form is an artificial intelligence um, that's learning and navigating a post-climate world. Reach takes place in a post-climate future Southern California, specifically uh, around Los Angeles. We follow a cast of characters composed of displaced wildfire victims as we, as we watch them journey across this, this wildfire changed um, landscape, constructing new rituals around a kind of post-climate future. So Echo is kind of the classic Gen Z. You see everything through her eyes. She kind of is your, is your main hero and she takes you across all the different landscapes in the project. The project for me is kind of a lot of trying to reconcile the relationship between technology and nature on a very spiritual level. So it's about kind of equating the understanding between technology and climate change and how those two are interconnected and how we can kind of use ritual and technology together to kind of create a new meaning. So none of the technologies we're talking about are inherently good or evil. They're, in many ways, exaggerations or extensions of ourselves, and they're fought with our own contradictions and frailties, our own hopes, dreams and desires and darkest fears. So what we're trying to do in, in projects like this and in fiction entertainment is explore the whole range of possible futures that, that these technologies might set in motion. And it's an engagement with multiple futures that really give us a critical edge. How can we know? We can't know. We can't know. But we have to think this stuff through, even if we know that our understanding at this point is limited. Uh, it's, it's part of our job to go pursue greater understanding. And, and I think that the core of it is forming that intention to treat as foundational that not just writing, not just designing, not just engineering, but reevaluating and reconsidering and, and revising and then, and then looking outward and bringing inward has to be part of the process over and over again. 